Welcome everyone. I am Victoria. I am social media coordinator for Renegade and I am here to well walk through my process of jam prep um, particularly with Wardlings, the 5e compatible cam campaign guide. So um, this is going to be interactive. So if you have any questions, if you just ask away, um, I'll also be running polls. Uh, if the, and uh, we'll, yeah, it's going to be fun. All right. So the first thing I do um, is I open up a document. I know that seems extremely... Uh, <laughs> not the most exciting thing, but I, I do like making myself, I like making a good document and also it makes it easier for me to refer to that document later. So we'll be like Wardlings of Rivers Hollow. And I like a good subtitle GM prep. All right. So I got my document and so the next thing I'm going to do is I scroll down and I'm going to look at the contents and I know again, is that really that exciting? No, but this is a process. Um, and the first thing I'm going to look at once I look what I'm looking for is I'm looking for locations. I always go for locations first because the locations are going to tell me what kind of culture is going to be there. There's going to be what kind of environment. So because the environment can shape a culture, it can shape a people, and it can also shape the type of encounters you're going to have. Um, so are they on the coast? So is there going to be seafaring uh, adventures? Or are they in the mountains? So are there going to be caves and mountain ranges? Are they in the forest? So there's forest encounters. So location is extremely important to me. And the, the location is what tells me what kind of stories we're going to tell. So that's what I look for. The first thing when I open up like a campaign guide or a setting guide like this is for me locations, because that that's going to tell me everything involved. Tell me in chat, like chat, what do you look for first when you're getting ready uh, for a game? Uh, uh, it can be any game. What what sort of thing are, do you go for, do you dive into first when you crack open that book? All right, so we are going to go to chapter eight locations. Now, I have already know that this campaign that I'm going to be doing is going to be set in Rivers Hollow. Uh, that is a place that I chose, um, mainly because it's cute and it's small. Um, and I looked at this just briefly. So let's find Rivers Hollow. I love the art in this. Look at this. This is adorable. Okay, let's scroll some down here. Rivers Hollow, here we go. In no place will you ever see so many children so powerful that their collective voice could take over the world, and yet they instead seek to preserve it. Oh, so Cal Marks, I would have to agree that location is the first thing I look at. It presents the settings for me and everything tends to build on that. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly how I go about it. So Rivers Hollow is nestled deep in a quiet hollow in the wildwood at the mouth of Ka Kodlavan River. Rivers Hollow is home to the greatest population of warnings in New York. That's the place for this setting. Uh, due to its proximity to the wildwood and the magical influence of the fae and familiars that dwell there. Okay, so wildwood. Now that's a key word. I need to look up where... Let's give this a heading. Um, let's see. Oh, you can probably hear my dog woofing in the background. I think someone's walking down the street. Uh, rivers. Hollow. So now I'm going to be looking at for keywords uh, because I'm going to have to look these up. So the wildwood. What's if this is 
in the location of the wildwood. near the river okay so wildwood is nestled in there near the river so that's just a note for me and I would put page 96 because this is just a quick reference for me that lets me know and you probably hear my mechanical keyboard sorry about that <laughs> uh yeah so uh, just quick reference for me to go back there so the few adults in Rivers Hollow um, work diligently to maintain their village. So this is mostly kids that live here. There are a few adults. As the population of New Earth grows, so does that of each village, but Rivers Hollow is a well-kept secret to those not connected to the Ur. So the Ur in this setting uh, is the magic. Um, it's the magic that only children have access to. Adults, once you kind of awaken, the, the reawakening, uh, once you awaken, um, you, you don't, you lose your, your ability to use magic or Ur. Or, or. Uh, so it's kept this so this this setting is kept secret and that that's also another reason why I wanted to use this one just because I like secrets and I like mystery and having kids come to the players as the kids coming to a place that is a secret that already adds a bit of of mystery and fun and yeah to to the to the setting and to the campaign Okay, so there are no shops or markets as found in other towns. That is good to know. No shops or markets. Uh, it looks like that the wardlings learn artisanal trades like sewing, smithing, and leather crafting, trading goods, and supplying their friends um, in need of clothes and weapons. And they camouflage by the other group, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, it looks like they barter. No shops or markets. So I will take this note is kids learn trades and barter for what they need. Okay, so now I've got some quick notes there. Um, well, it's well hidden. Knowledge of Rivers Hollow sometimes reaches the wrong ears. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, love it. Because that... That adds the excitement. So that there's already a hook right here in the setting. So I'm going to use that. Um, wrong ears. About the secret place. All right. So kids learn trades and barter for what they need. The wrong ears hear about the secret place. Um, And no standing army. I know some people might find this redundant, uh, but for me, uh, rewriting something out and taking quick notes for me to be able to reference um, not only helps me have something to reference, um, but it helps me remember. And so, especially since I'm using another setting that I haven't, it's not homebrewed that I'm utterly familiar with because I made it up. Um, this gives me quick touchstones that I can just, you know, grab and look at and then remember um, so that once I start DMing, once I'm in the process of running the game, that information is easier for me to recall. So find your trick. What are some tricks that you have that help you recall information? Is writing something down or typing it out or taking notes or do you use like mind maps or things like that? What what do you do? I want to hear about them in chat. I'd love to hear it. Okay, so there is no standing army, but there is wardling, rangers, rogues, and fighters that maintain village security. All right. 
Oh, this is when we get exciting. I love this part. This part is one of my favorite parts about prepping for a campaign. Because remember, this isn't... We're not prepping adventures here because we haven't even had a session zero yet. So we don't know what players are looking for and what they want out of the game. We haven't set tones. We haven't set theme. We haven't done any of that information yet. Uh, so right now what we're doing is we're digging into the source material and looking for things that we like that we can then present to the players at session zero and say these are some of the things that are found in that will be found in this campaign these are the things that you are presenting them to them and they say well, how do you feel about this and what are some of your ideas and then together collaboratively you can come and create a campaign um, so you get all that information from them and then that once you get all that information, that's when you start creating the adventures and the, and the modules. But I, I'm not going to do that um, until after I do this part. So this is what I'm getting together to showcase to my players. So the cottage of the chosen. All right, the chosen. Who is the chosen? I need to know this because that seems really important. <laughs> so crouching low at the base of a large knotted oak, as though it were trying to hide even from residents' eyes, the cottage of the chosen is home to the current chosen. Okay, we're getting the info here that I need. A title passed on to another once the current holder is reawakened. Okay, so it's a title that's passed until someone is reawakened. Although seemingly commonplace from afar, with its charmingly crooked thatch roof and unevenly sized gray stones that make up its walls, the cottage gives off an aura of power that can be felt by those that can be felt by those close by. Inside the cottage, a simple kitchen and living room lead to a small library stuffed with private diaries, ornate spellbooks, and curious tomes. So there's vials and potions, a wooden ladder to a loft, a modest sleeping area, uh, nearly always at home. So the Chosen is nearly always at home and ready for their students' needs. The Chosen is often found sitting at their kitchen table, sipping hot tea made from herbs gathered from the wildwood. I love that. That is so lovely. That is such a lovely concept. Okay, so we are going to... I need to make a note as who is the chosen? Because I need to look that up. Because um, the cottage of the chosen is important. The chosen is obviously an important figure. So I need to learn more about the chosen. And so we're on page 97. I'm going to remember that. Oh, I'm on the wrong. There we go. Chosen. Where are you chosen? The chosen has said, yep. On warm nights, the chosen. Oh, here we go. Fiona Fulbright, that's an NPC. It's Fiona Fulbright, human chosen wardling. The chosen is a title passed down to the one selected. It was, I love how I'm doing a search and it's literally right in front of my face. <laughs> ah, good looking and reading, Victoria. The chosen is a title passed down to the one selected by the previous chosen just before their reawakening. While Rivers Hollow has no ruling power, the Chosen serves as the leader of the village, like an old-souled elder despite their young age. Okay. The current Chosen is Fiona Fulbright, a cleric-trained wardling with a hawk familiar. She showed extreme talent when seven years old. Caring and intuitive, she has expanded her magical power to learn spells from all over the spellcasting disciplines. So she is an older... So it's just before their reawakening. So she's a teen and she's the chosen. Okay, that's good to know. So the chosen who teaches um, and leads the village. And that's Fiona Fulbright. This is page 97. So I'm going to keep that note. 
for me. Ever Lake. Cod Lavin River greets Ever Lake in the heart of Rivers Hollow. Regard for its serene beauty and healing properties, Ever Lake always looks as if it's glimmering. Okay, so there's a lake in town. Ever Lake healing properties. Oh, it'd be good if I could spell properties. There we go. So, hi, new viewers. Um, I recently asked a question about how, what are some tips or tricks that you have that you help to remember information uh, within the setting? For me, I do this. I make notes um, and I just quick point form notes with page numbers so that I can quick reference. What are ways that you organize your notes, especially when you're doing all of this background stuff? Because right now we are preparing for a campaign. Now this is pre-session zero. Um, so this is all that information you're gathering and putting together so that when you have your session zero, you can present it to your players and be like, okay, so we're creating characters here. This is the setting. These are the important things that I need you to know about the setting. And then from there, you can create characters, you can talk about tone, you can talk about themes. So what are, what are some ways that you get ready um, to remember this information? Because if you have an easier or you think it's an easier way, I would love to hear it. <laughs> but uh, for me, it's, it's reading and taking notes. Okay, so the lake in town has healing properties. And it looks like the Chosen brings wardlings here. To tell... Oh, interactive tales. So that's cool. I like that. Um, creating visions of light and fancy above the water as the stories unfold. Bards perform, wizards practice new spells, and druids commune with the plants and animals, making Ever Lake a re recreational place of learning for the wardling community. Okay, so it's a place of learning and recreation or the community. This is where they gather. Okay, Greenleaf Hall. It's the largest dormitory in Rivers Hollow. Okay, so people live in dormitories here. That's good to know. Um, Greenleaf Hall. Um, it's a dormitory. With some wardlings that are young as four years old. Wow. Um, and this is for all the wardlings who live here without their parents. It's dug partially underground for safety and has several shared bedrooms as well. Oh, that's why. Oh, I thought it was called Greenleaf Hollow, but no, it's Rivers Hollow that we're in. It's dug partially underground for safety and has several shared bedrooms, as well as a large shared living area where older wardlings teach them about survival and Ur. Okay, and for those just joining us, Ur is magic. Dormitory half underground for safety. All right, we have Daisy Lazur, who's, oh no, stolen out of her bed by a malevolent fae when she was a toddler. Daisy was left in the wildwood as a gift for the green hag who commanded them. Before the hag was able to claim her, a squirrel familiar chose Daisy to protect and alerted a team of rangers to her presence who brought her to Rivers Hollow. Now five years later, she is druid of the Circle of Water. Um, so she's only about eight years old if she was a toddler. It's been five years. I love this game already. It's so adorable. I love that we're playing just children. Um, she is a druid of the Circle of Water, having learned of its power by researching and studying Everlake's arcane qualities. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Hi Go, elf trainer, master of melee and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Hi Go is a private trainer to both adults who wish to learn self-defense and to wardlings who aspire to be fighters. Okay. Holden War Hunter, Human Ranger, Wardling. Okay, for me, that's for notable NPCs in this area. Who I'm really interested in is Fiona Falbright, Human Chosen Wardling. Um, I'll probably end up using her quite 
a lot, especially since she is the, she is the leader of the town. Okay, so that is points of interest. I want a map. Where is a map? Because I want to see what is near. Oh, we need to learn about the wildwood. Wildwood. An eerie breeze, fallen trees, the whispers of the fae echo in this enchantingly foreboding place. I am fearful of what I'll discover, but somehow I can't stay away. So it's overgrown with ancient cheese. <laughs> ancient cheese. I think I'm hungry. And echoes of Ur at every turn. The woods of Na'ur are the host of the magical beings of Ormaya. The forest canopy fills the sky overhead with branches of alder, hawthorn, and ash. While random spots of light that break through the leaves attract beautiful and diverse plants. Okay, and so it is... Regardless of the season, the trees of wildwood are filled with Ur, whether bursting with color that come alight with pink and green flowers in spring. Okay. All right. So let's, let's take our notes of Wildwood because Wildwood is important to us since Rivers Hall is located there. All right, so points of interest, an abandoned cottage. All right, seems an abandoned at a glance or two, except to keen eyes who notice a wispy ribbon of smoke rising from the old chimney. The walls are made of the same wood as the trees that surround it, though the roof is clearly stone, and being so old and unsupported, is a wonder that is not caved in. Inside, investigation will find that the fire is lit by a magical flame. Parchments and other clues in the sparsely decorated cottage indicate that a wizard of some sort lives here, but this doesn't look like the home of a wardling. Oh interesting so there is someone or something that lives there i like that moonlight pools a small path from the northern break in the wildwood leads to a forest glen these three pools of crystalline water can be found here each glowing with light as bright as the moon it's a stomping ground for fey of all sorts as the pools attract fey creatures for a reason not yet discovered the squatch of burlden who live nearby and hunt fey for their underground market value are known to seek easy targets here. Okay. All right. I I like that. I like that uh, there's moonlit pools. And fey encounters are always fun. I really enjoy them. So. Moonlit pools. Fey congregate here. Congregate here. So that's a good point for me. Oh, I should put what page that's on. Page 102. Um, the Fallen Five. The Fallen Five are five large oak tree folk that one day, long ago, rotted out from the inside. Now just shells of open bark, they are merely ruins of the immense intelligence and power they had once held, broken and strewn in an open glade of the wildwood. Their trunks are marked with arcane symbols that many believe to be a map or key to unlocking new secrets of the Ur. The symbols have never been deciphered, even by the truth. Okay, here we go. We got a hook right here. <laughs> the Fallen Five. Five old oak trees. And then with oak, you can bring in so much imagery from folklore and fable, uh, which is great. I'm excited. Five old oak trees with symbols never deciphered. All right. This is also page 102. I'm definitely going to be using that because look at that. Whispering Way. The Whispering Ray is a shortcut to the trade route from the Dragon's Mouth Bay to Saltwick that cuts through the wild wood. Named for the whispers of confusion, fortune, sadness, and horror that can be heard while traveling down the path. <sighs> Spooky, and I love it. I love it. While the road is the most traveled in the enchanted woods and wide enough for a wing and a horse and cart, it is still a dangerous path for anyone not familiar with the ways of the Fae and their trickery. Whispers heard on the way vary from person to person. Even if a group travels together, many who have taken the route have gone mad, 
when unable to escape the hideous mind-altering voices. Whispering way. Scary, spooky place with scary, spooky, whispering. Yep. Page one or two. Use this. That's just my note to myself. Use it. All right, so now we have some notable NPCs here. Little is known about Edwin the Reborn, except for rumors of his existence in the Wildwood. Described as an eccentric, white-haired elderly man who lives alone in the forest, stories say that Edwin was once a chosen nearly 90 years ago. It said that after a lifetime of working in Saltwick as a librarian, he has lost his faculties and disappeared into the forest. Since that time, bursts of spectral light and surges of ore have been witnessed in the eastern woods, fueling gossip that Edwin has somehow reclaimed his connection with the ore. Ooh, I like, I like. Okay. We could put this person in the abandoned. Edwin is an elderly man living in the abandoned cottage in the wood. There we go. Uh, found his connection with Ur. There we go. We'll ask that question. All right. Here's the map. This is what I wanted to find out. Now I want to zoom in to this. So there's River Hollow right here. There's Ever Lake. And here's the Wildwood. Okay. Saltwick is just here. So if I'm setting it here, I'm going to want to know about, there's the wild wood, and I am also going to need to know, oh, that's Saltwick. This is a place that I think that's a W. It's hard to tell. <laughs> Oh, we got an introductory adventure. Okay. Well, that's actually really good to look at. Um, because if if you look at pre-adventures, it will help you learn about the game and how they this is supposed to run. So beginning of the adventure, episode one, episode two, episode three. Six hours to play. All right, cool, cool, cool. Well, I'm not quite here yet as this art is so great. I love it. Let's bring that up so you can see that picture a little bit. There we go. Alright, so let's go back up here. Let's go back to the chapter. I think I've got my... Because all of this stuff, the magic and familiars, um, our classes, and our faces, that is all going to be stuff that we do in session zero and this this is pre-session zero prep so i think now at this point i've got my setting this is where i want to be so i'm going to make this larger and i'm just going to go here and yeah i want to remove that there we go so now at this point, 
I want to create, I want to insert a page break here. There we go. So let's give a heading session zero. So this is going to be my prep. So what are we going to do? We're going to introductions. We're going to introduce each other. And I always enjoy asking a question for um, why do you like RPGs? What makes you come back? Back to them. Or why are you interested in trying an RPG out? What calls to you? Now, the reason why I'm asking this question as a GM is this is going to tell me what style of play these players are into and what it is that they're looking for. Um, I also like to ask what is something you hope to find in this campaign. Something, this, this kind of goes along with feedback of Stars and Wishes. If you haven't heard about Stars and Wishes, I'll go onto that a little quickly. Um, a star is something that you enjoy, something that you loved during the game, during the module, the adventure, whatever. I like to use a star and wish after every session. So something you enjoyed in that session that you liked. It could be something someone else did. It could be something you did. It could be so, like just a story aspect. It could be anything that you enjoyed. And then a wish is something that you hope to see, something you would like to explore, something you would like to happen in the game. And that's a wish. And that that's great feedback for me. Um, I like it instead of like comments, um, thoughts, the reason being is it gives people a very specific avenue to answer and to provide that feedback. So stars and wishes. So what is something you hope to find in this campaign is kind of like asking what do you what what is your wish uh, from for this campaign? What do you want out of this? Uh, and what would you like to see in it? What would you like to explore? And that can, again, as a GM, helps you create a campaign in a game that your players all want to play. And it's, it's just an inclusive way of, of starting it out. So that's why I like doing that. So introductions. Okay, so we'll start with introductions. We ask our questions of why you're into it. And then we will go over safety tools. Safety tools are important. We will talk about lines and veils and the traffic light system. What are lines and veils and what are the traffic light system? So lines and veils. A line is something that you do not want to see in the game. It's something that makes you uncomfortable. It's something that you just don't want to be in the game. And What's really important about this is when you're going over the lines, you never ask why. We don't need to know why. We don't need to drum up people's trauma. We don't need people to relive stuff. So we never ask why. We simply ex accept and respect that this makes someone uncomfortable. So that's why we would um, ask for lines. So very common lines that you'll, you often find are child harm. You don't want like young children to die. People don't like that or seeing young children being beaten up or things like that. So that's, that's a common line that I come across. Uh, another one is sexual assault. Another one is racism. Another one is uh, derogatory comments about marginalized groups. Uh, those are all very common lines. Now a veil. A veil is something that you don't mind seeing in the game, but you don't want to go into detail about it. You want to veil it. You want to fade to black. Uh, it's something that makes you uncomfortable if you go into too much detail. A very common one that I come across is torture. If, okay, you want to torture the goblin, that's fine, but I, I don't want to go into detail of how you go about doing that to get that information. 
Uh, so those are lines and veils. And what's important about these is you can always um, add lines and you can always add veils throughout the game. Because um, sometimes you come across something that you had no idea bothered you until it happened. I had one that came up that I now line all the time and that's saliva. So let me, <laughs> I'll tell you a quick little story of why um, in, I am offering this, this story. I'm not, no one's asking me about it. So that's the difference. Uh, so we were playing a game of Dungeons and Dragons with some friends and we had our characters hung out at a certain tavern and we, the one character laughingly said, yeah, I buy the one copper drink that only costs a copper because it's just the dregs of everyone's leftover drinks gross that's gross as right there I can deal with that that's gross as long as I don't think about it too hard we can veil that however at the time I didn't realize how grossed out I was until the jokes started going and we started going into more detail and detail about that situation and and at it got to the point where I was literally gagging at the table and I was like okay y'all we can we X card this and the next card is is another safety tool that you can use um, where something comes up that makes someone uncomfortable um, and they just say X card or they touch something that's red on the on the table or a card that has an X on it and they touch the X yes I keep safety tools right near at hand all, almost all the time um, yeah so we did that and that's what I learned. I do not like graphic depictions of saliva and now I line that because I just don't I just don't want to have to deal with that again. So that's totally fair and remember that things might come up. Now that brings me to the traffic light system because the traffic light system goes hand in hand with lines and veils. So that's this card, if you can see it. Oh, you can see the green has been blocked out by um, the green screen. But, um, and the green screen's having a hard time. Oh, it's starting to get darker outside. That's why there's not as much light. Let me see if I can fix, well, it's fine. I'm just here um, looking at, at text. It's That's okay. It's not like this is a video game. So, the traffic light system. The traffic light system, I briefly talked about the X card. So the X card here is going to be something that is a line. It comes up in the in the game and you press this because you you're you hold up something red. Um, sometimes it's something as basic as all you got a red is a red pen. So you just hold up something red indicating, look, we got a we got to redirect the scene. We got to stop this here. Um, I'm really uncomfortable. I do not like this. We're approaching. We're at line territory here. We're not approaching it. We're at it and we need to stop. That's what red is. And then we have yellow. Yellow or, you know, sometimes I just use a pencil because it's yellow. Um, you hold that up or you touch something on the table and that's saying we're approaching line territory or we're approaching we're at veil territory so let's let's just redirect the scene let's veil this let's fade to black and move on uh, because we're, we're getting to territory that's going to make me extremely uncomfortable and then the green which you can see because green screen maybe if I hold up no green screen doesn't like anything green um but so you hold up something green or you touch something green on the table and that is just for you to check in saying yeah I'm fine I'm cool like maybe your character is going through something traumatic or maybe you're role-playing and your character is really upset but you as a player you're having a grand old time that's you're just letting everyone know at the table no I'm fine I'm just really into whatever it is that we're doing so that that are those are the safety tools that I use at my tables um, so I always talk about them at the session zero. So introductions, we have our safety tools. Um, and then at that point, we'll talk about tone. 
So I'll ask what kind of tone do people want from this game? What are it is that they're looking for? And then we'll agree on come to a group consensus of what kind of tone we will have for a game. So it, are we going to be grimdark? Are we going to be more lighthearted and cartoony? Are we going to be epic? Are, you know, are we going to be more action oriented? All that kind of stuff. So theme and then themes, what kind of themes do we want to explore? Because theme is important and themes can really affect and hit people. So I always like to go over tone. We like to, and then we can agree on themes that we want to go over. So we have our introductions, we have our safety tools, we have our tone, we have our theme. And then at this point, we'll go over the setting. So this is where I got, I have all my notes here. I can quickly go over the setting with them and explain to them, okay, so we are going to be set in Rivers Hollow and it is nestled within the Wildwood, which is this great thick forest full of magic and fae and go into the details. And that's what all those notes are on the other side there, or I guess on this side, I should do opposite. <laughs> on this side of the screen, um, that's what where all those notes that I've taken from the book come in handy. So I go over the setting with everyone. And then once I go over the setting and we have our tone and we have our themes, then we go into character creation because the tone, theme, and setting can definitely affect what kind of characters people are going to create. Because who are the type of people who live in this setting, right? So you're, you're going to have, are you going to have someone who's from somewhere else that has moved here? And what, what do they think of this new area? How does this affect their, their outlook and their behavior? Um, all of these things are important. Or if you're from here, how does that affect your your thought processes, your your worldview, your behavior? Uh, so character creation I like to do after all of that stuff. So then we'll do character creation and then we will do some world building together. Um, and even though we have our world, we have our setting. Um, but we know that there's Greenleaf Hall, which is a dormitory, which is half underground for safety, but we don't know exactly how it's made up of. So at that point we can come up with that together and we don't all have all the locations in Rivers Hollow. Rivers Hollow isn't just a cottage, some dormitories, wildwood, and a lake. Well, there's no shops and stores. Well, is there a library? Um, is there... A mess hall? Is there a, a, a village square? And what do people do in the village square? All of those sorts of things. So we will create that together. I like doing that together um, as a group because then when the players come in, they're already immersed in the world. They already have expectations. They already have ideas. Uh, and because this is a collaborative storytelling process. This isn't me telling a story and everyone else following along. This is us telling a story together. So uh, that's why I like to do world building after a character creation. Um, and also like doing it after a character creation because then people can add things to the village that pertain to their characters. It helps root their characters in that place and gives them a reason for being in that place. Then after we have our world building, I like building up relationships. So I like to ask questions with, um, like, how do you know each other? Um, how do you know each other? Um, how long have you known each other? And we'll go, we'll go through um, all of our people's relationships like this. Um, so each character has a minimum of two relationships with other characters. So I, how do you know each other? How long have you known each other? 
what do you think of each other? When, what happened when you first met? So what was the situation regarding when you first met? And then we can tell that story together in our relationships. And what is your favorite memory with this person? Um, what is something you don't like about this person? Because everyone has faults. On my best friend, I love them to pieces. But they're always late. And that bugs me. Because <laughs> I'm one of those people that's on time. Love them to pieces, but they're late. So there's always going to be those kinds of relationships. And I like kind of creating them from the beginning uh, so that we can just jump right into the storytelling. We don't have to have that awkwardness that can sometimes happen in the first few sessions. This just, it ends up being a lot easier um, for people to just really be absorbed in the story and in the relationships with everyone. Okay, so then we have our relationships and then I like to create NPCs with everyone. I know some people might think this is cheating, but who is a person outside of the party that is important to you? Because these NPCs can help root the, the player characters um, in the story as well. You can bring them into the campaign. You can um, bring them and create really, really meaningful stories for your, for your players because you're bringing them in. Um, who is a person... you don't like or you don't get along with right because you you want that dichotomy because you need you need some some strife <laughs> and there we go and then we'll do stars and wishes because this is a session. It's not a playing session, but it is a session. All right. Well, does anyone have any questions about GM prep? Because at this point, I am ready for session zero. I am ready to sit down with my players, which I will be doing actually tomorrow, um, and going over a lot of this stuff. So what, any questions before we go? There's been a lot of coming and going. So if we don't have any questions, I will wait just a few, well, a minute um, to see if there are. And then, because then I think we're ready to go. We're ready to rock. Okay, I don't think there are any questions. So if that's the case, I'm going to call this a stream and we, oh, when prepping a pre-made campaign, thank you, Cal Marx. I'll let you finish. We do have a question, folks. They are typing. I will moisten my mouth with my Mio and club soda. Do, do, do. When prepping a pre-made campaign, do you do it in chunks or try to look through the whole book before meeting with your players? Um, <laughs> okay, ideally, I would read it all. Um, but I don't. <laughs> because, let's face it, I'm a bit of a procrastinator. And I, I'm, I'm, I follow the lazy GM style of... Of playing. Um, I'm an improv GM. 
through and through. So um, I'll often do it in chunks. I might skim through to the end just to see where the outcome is or where the outcome should be, uh, just so that I can kind of guide people along. But because I am an improv GM, I what essentially I, I just do is I read over the pre-made um, campaign. I grab the important plot points. It's usually the in the synopsis and I just work from there. Um, I, I honestly don't follow um, it word for word for word. Um, I just take the main points, uh, take the mood, take the um, atmosphere from it and then create it in my own words. Because uh, I, I have a hard time using another person's words and feeling authentic. Um, it feels forced to me as a personally. Now, there are other people who really rely on other people's words because that's just how they feel comfortable. And that's fine too. But for me, um, I, I tend to skim. I grab the main points. I put them in a um, just a similar document like I did here. Just some quick some quick bullet points so that I can refer to them if I need to. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously I'll mark out the stat blocks for any creatures or anything like that that I need. And then I just keep that very short bits of information in front of me instead of going through lots of pages. So yeah, that's how I prep pre-made campaigns. Any other questions? I hope that's helpful. Wet the whistle. You're welcome, Kalmart. Okay, well, I don't think there are any more questions, so we're going to call it. And I hope everyone has a great time. Please tune in on Monday. We have our Renegade Painters. We're painting our Power Rangers miniatures. And don't forget to sign up for our Arboretum tournament. You can find that on our socials, on our Twitter and that's a Play Renegade. And you can sign up for our Arboretum tournament that we have going on over Gen Con. And also, if you're into Vampire the Masquerade at all, check out tomorrow our social media. Because there's going to be some fun stuff. Just give me a little hint. A little hint. There's going to be some stuff that we're, we're going to let, let out. So yeah. Anyway, everyone, thank you for joining us. And remember, Renegades... Play your game. Bye.